the old world is ending, and we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the structural problems in our world and the real solutions that we have today to transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse into a collaborative and sustainable futuristic society that serves all life. You may think it's an impossible dream, but the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Zachary Marlowe, Matt Holton, and Amanda Smith. And together, when we can move past this economic absurdity to come together and actualize our collective potential to create something completely new, we are Moneyless Society. Good evening, my fellow Americans. This evening, I come to you with a message of leave-taking and farewell, and to share a few final thoughts with you, my countrymen. A vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. And the power of money is ever-present and is gravely to be regarded. War. This massive, monstrous, looming force that seems to touch everything that is completely intertwined in our monetary system. We live in an empire, unquestionably. Every single time we spend money, we are fueling this ravenous, blood sucking monster that is crushing and destroying the, the, the world. It's this aspect of our life that we don't see. We don't turn on the TV and really see war, but every moment of our lives, war is happening, and that's it's fueling this way of life, and it's something that we just need to discuss. So today, I've linked up with two sparkling, marvelous guests, uh, Prentice and Joey, who I both linked up with on Instagram, and uh, Joey runs a page called War is a Racket, which for the last year or so has been one of the best uh, resources on understanding the war machine, the the global state of imperialism and all of this. And uh, Prentice is running another page that is just disseminating information, telling the truth. I feel like there's no better way to start this episode than just by opening the floor to Joey and Prentice to tell their own stories. I originate from uh, East St. Louis, Illinois. It's one of the poorest Black communities in the United States has a long history of racial violence and just, you know, struggle in general in terms of the American experience and the Black experience. From there, I joined the Army. I ended up uh, deploying in 2001, the height of the Iraq War. You know, serving in the Iraq War and seeing the destruction firsthand that our, our military apparatus, you know, the military industrial complex, was creating, just seeing it firsthand and seeing the the carnage. It planted a lot of seeds in my in my head. You know, I could see, you know, firsthand what was happening versus what the media was saying was happening. You know, because we get uh papers and stuff like that from back home and I would see like what they were saying our battalion was doing versus what we were actually doing. So, you know, we get these propaganda pieces in the media where they were, were showing us, you know, handing out chocolates and stuff like that, you know, versus us, uh, you know, actually shelling the communities with artillery rounds and stuff like that. So that right there initially kind of snapped me out of my slumber, I would say, and you know, just planted seeds in my mind and got me asking why, why? you know, and, and how, why and how this 
propaganda apparatus, how it operated and why it operated. And also, you know, when I was out there, I was noticing cultural differences between, you know, Western culture, which was us from the United States versus an Eastern culture, um, you know, the Iraqi people and the people in the Middle East. So I'm seeing these stark differences in how, you know, two people live and sort of this clash of civilizations. So that additionally also planted seeds in my head. Now, of course, when you're out there in a war zone, you can't get access to information the way you really want, um, especially at that time in the war when we really didn't you know, have um, modernized bases and stuff like that. Um, so when I finally made it back home, thankfully I did, uh, you know, before this, I didn't have access to a computer. You know, I couldn't afford a computer. So when I got home, I finally was able to afford a computer. So I finally got a computer. And like I said, I had all these questions planted in my mind, you know. And so when I finally saw the Internet, I knew I could not, I knew I could not take it for granted. So I started reading everything I could. I didn't even get a TV for like the first year I was back. And so I started running into like Noam Chomsky reading everything up Dr. Cornell West was writing in terms of him criticizing the war and stuff like that. As I went along, I just started answering these questions and just realizing just how much we took for granted as knowing, you know, and just this, this uh, absence of knowledge and, and how in that absence, the propaganda was allowed to uh, become successful. America faces an enemy who has no regard for conventions of war or rules of morality. I believe that's, that's what kind of put me on my path to being sort of a radical in that regard. You know, I went from there, there to, you know, just starting just a disciplined regimen of reading. And then along the way, I run into other people who were reading and uh, hungry for knowledge. You know, eventually I started getting into us uh, uh, hosting book readings and stuff like that. So I started, what I would do was I would uh, get these thick texts and I would take information, complex information, and kind of break it down into digestible chunks for people online. And uh, so, you know, I would convert these texts, this text to memes. And I, I discovered that this right here was what attracted young people's attention. Versus, you know, just posting big blocks of, uh, of text from the books and stuff. And from there, it just uh, kind of grew and grew. You know, that kind of uh, led me to where I am today in terms of my approach to things. Not to try to sum up such a big topic, but in the spirit of taking uh, an intractably complex issue and distilling it into something that can be understood. I mean, what in that period did you learn was the truth of the reasons why you were doing what you were doing, why the war machine was, was raging? You know, what, what is it all about? In a nutshell, it's capitalism. You know, the idea, and it is the, the idea that the purpose of America is to create one market under God one market under God. And the people who run America are absolutely fanatics when it comes to this idea. It's actually bordering on a religion. It's a religion and a, a death cult. You know, it's, you can liken it to uh, in the Matrix when Morpheus showed Neo that the Duracell battery and said, that's the purpose of the Matrix to take a, a human being and reduce them to a Duracell battery, <laughs> you know, to turn them into this unit of in energy to serve the market. And that's, that's basically how they see everybody on the planet. And so any, any country or any group of people, and in particular uh, brown people uh, on planet Earth who created an alternative way of life, uh, especially a collective way of life, that enabled them to thrive and, um, you know, thrive economically was a danger to capitalism. And so that's why they had to destroy Cuba. That's why they had to destroy Indonesia. That's why they had to destroy Africa. And, you know, there's books like, a great book in particular is The Enchantments of Mammon, 
And in that book, and I think that book is 800, 800 something pages, and it is full of just quote after quote after quote from the big movers and shakers throughout history, economically, where it's, it's illustrating and depicting their absolute religious fanaticism for uh, the pursuit of profits and profits over people. You know, and that's resulted in this big engine of imperialism, the U.S. military, which today is, you know, the greatest polluter on planet Earth. That's what I've uh, come down to in my research. And, you know, I'm in the belly of the beast now down here in Dallas, Texas, where, you know, capitalism truly reigns supreme, you know, where they just let uh, 150 people freeze to death in a winter storm, you know, because... They didn't want to regulate the uh, energy, the energy corporations. You're you're in the mecca of uh, of zealots who don't give a fuck about other people. <laughs> exactly. This is Trump land, USA down here. Just this 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 fanaticism is actually bordering on delusional fanaticism to the point where they actually now define corporations as people. They define corporations as people. And under the uh, 15th Amendment, they've actually defended corporations under that more often than actual people. That's how fanatical they are about capitalism. And, you know, this is, <laughs> this is as religious as it gets. So this is, even if you may be a, an atheist or an agnostic, this is a spiritual war that's being waged against every, every man, woman, and child on planet Earth. And if we don't stop these these idiots, they're going to destroy planet Earth for the pursuit of profits. I actually grew up in Houston. I spent about 20 years in Houston, so I'm very, very familiar with the culture down there and just how um, you know white white fanaticism in general. You know, I, I, I growing up there, I, I knew like a lot of racist people too, who are just you know, I mean, not a bunch, but there were a few who were just kind of like. You know, like what, what? What are you talking about, dude? Like they were just like racist to the to the core, almost. You know, they just didn't want to have anything to do with people of a of a different uh, color skin. You know, I was just kind of. It struck me as odd, even just growing up, because there were other people who weren't that way. But you know, you would encounter encounter people like that, and it was just. Uh, it put, a, it put a very odd taste in my mouth because I wasn't born there either. I kind of moved there later in my life, uh, too, when I was, you know, probably a little bit older and uh, uh, at least in childhood to to kind of see other cultures before that. But yeah, and it's interesting, too, that you say that, um, you know, there's the, the, the ideology and the kind of the almost religious fanaticism in general takes it as a threat, you know, when, when people of another color come together and they start thriving, especially economically. And it's really interesting. We were just talking about this the other day. Uh, we're coming up on the 100-year uh, uh anniversary of the tulsa race massacre um you know not too, not too far from where you are there up in uh, tulsa oklahoma and um i mean just i was listening to a couple of the stories of the survivors of it i mean they're like one of them is a lady who's 107 years old now but just i mean for for the last hundred years of her life she's lived with you know just the memories of of you know being a child just stripped from her home seeing people dying in the streets homes being burned you know mass graves of of, of uh, you know community members being thrown in there and then just any future that she had was just completely taken from her she she was living in a thriving community you know uh you know built by and for black people in, in tulsa oklahoma there and and these white fanaticists just literally came and burnt it to the ground and they dropped bombs literally dropped bombs on american soil the first time that's like literally ever happened i think and uh, I mean, just how, how atrocious of an act can you possibly be? And, and now, a hundred years later, finally, they're they're recognizing it and asking for reparations, which I think, honestly, they deserve because those we, we took their future away from a, so many people. You know, the least we could do is do something about it at some point, even if it's a hundred years later. And I, I totally agree with them coming out and saying, "Hey, you, we we deserve something. You know, we we had we had something better in store for us, and you and and they we were literally stripped of this by your and ancestors and uh you know i don't blame them at all uh, that's great that you mentioned reparations because you know a lot of times um the question will come up and you know will be posed by uh white conservatives they'll they'll say well you know uh slavery was so long ago you know i don't owe black people anything 
You know, this country doesn't owe black people anything, you know, other than, um, you know, just just to be given, you know, job opportunity or whatever. You know, slavery wasn't that long ago. If you were a black person born in 1959, your parents' parents were slaves. So that's that's only three generations removed from slavery. Uh, and also, uh, segregation just ended 50 years ago. So you have people, you have black people who are alive today who spent at least a decade of their life in segregation. You know, most of the wealth that white people have was a result of inheritance, inheritance of property and things like that. But black people were excluded from programs like the Homestead Act, from which a lot of white America inherited and accumulated the wealth and resources that they still pass down today. And, and I'd like to add too, it's it's not just inheritance. A lot of the time, it's simply being in a better position. You know, whether that be uh, economically, financially. Um, you know, sometimes even just uh, in the right area. You know, to, in, in having access to resources and things that uh, you know the the other the, the poor communities don't. You know, essentially. And, uh, you know, just the opportunities that are there for you to take advantage of, you know, just because your parents weren't wealthy and you didn't inherit wealth. And let's say you went out and made a lot of money. That doesn't mean that you didn't experience some privileges, you know, in some areas that other that other, uh, you know, racial groups didn't have access to. You know, and I think that's a that's a point that, that, that a lot of people overlook, too. It's just simply the opportunities that were given to certain groups that weren't given to others. You know, even when we talk about you know, giving black people jobs and they'll say, well, you know, everybody has the same job opportunity or whatever. Well, in actuality, a white man with a felony is more likely to get a job than a black man without a felony. That was proven in numerous studies. So that idea that, you know, we all have the same opportunities is BS. The reality of racism and the intolerable iniquity, it's staggering. I mean, and to kind of bring things back into the the topic of of the war machine, I mean, economic warfare is being waged on us all at all times. And that's, we don't just shoot people. We do. And, you know, that's an incredibly profitable industry. It's America's number one export to the world is weapons. And that's something that I'm sure we're going to dig more into. But, you know, all of this is is a war. It's a class war. So I kind of want to bring Joey back into the conversation here and and, um, uh, talk about your story, your perspective on all this. What brought you here? Yeah, so, uh, you know, my light bulb moment did not occur while I was in the military. It occurred afterwards, which I'll get to in a little bit. But uh, basically, I joined the Marines in 2012. Uh, This was around the time where uh, the other wars were kind of dying down a bit, Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, They weren't ending. They were just... uh, uh, the form of fighting these wars were changing. I mean, in the, the ways of deploying mass levels of troops that we saw, like in Iraq and Afghanistan, were on the downswing, and we saw the upswing of more uh, use of more drones and the use of uh, special forces, and of course, the privatization of war with all these mercenary groups, um, such as Eric Prince's uh, Blackwater, like we've seen in Iraq, like we're seeing in Afghanistan, uh, with the, just the privatization of all these wars. So there wasn't really a lot of, there's not really as much, uh, I guess, opportunities for uh, deployment into these, these zones right around the time I joined uh, compared to uh, the, the peak of these wars in the early 2000s. So I was basically in Japan for uh, two years. And uh, in Japan, we, uh, we went on a few, uh, we went on like uh, Muse to uh, the Philippines and uh, the Korean Peninsula. And we did all these things. And I didn't really know why we were doing these things. Um, it didn't really make sense until way after I got out. But, uh, you know, just seeing how in, like, Japan, for example, just seeing how uh, how much, uh, especially where I was in Okinawa, there were protests all the time, especially by U.S. military bases of Okinawans who wanted the U.S. out of their country. And because the U.S. service members were causing a lot of trouble, uh, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, Prentice could uh, speak to this, but, hey, when... Uh, When a person in the military has a lot of time on their hands and uh, a lot of money to waste, what are they going to spend it on? They're going to spend on alcohol, on tattoos. And, you know, in Okinawa, a lot of uh, Marines and other service members there would cause a lot of trouble. You would have uh, you would have rapes and sexual assaults and uh, 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 DUIs and even murder. And just uh, and just uh, that that's one thing that really kind of hit me, not so much at the time, but uh, 
after I got out, just seeing, and I'm, and I'm sure this is the same way in almost every other country the U.S. is in, because, you know, the U.S. has hundreds of military bases, and, you know, we're told that uh, they're supposedly there to protect democracy. But, you know, with just like a apprentice hit the nail right on the head, it's about uh, preserving this global capitalist system. It's about uh, preserving a system where the world's uh, resources, labor, land, and markets are available at bargain prices to multinational corporations. And any time a country wants to pursue its own course of economic development, which places its uh, resources and land and labor and markets at the disposal of its own population to, uh, to meet the needs of society rather than just uh, meeting the needs of uh, the pocket of, of the bank accounts of multinational corporations, then what you see is you see the CIA and you see the military and you have all these, uh, you have these coups like we saw in the later part of the Cold War in countries like Chile like Indonesia, um, like Iran, and then, you know, we would see the Iraq war in the early 2000s. So whenever uh, countries try to, uh, you know, the Vietnam War, uh, Vietnam war as well, uh, Korean, uh, et cetera. So uh, basically, whenever a country tries to pursue its own, a course of economic development, which put, puts its own, uh, the needs of its own uh, population first and foremost, rather than uh, placing priority on profits, then these countries are targeted because the, uh, the United States and the, uh, the multinational corporations and capitalist class that control the economy and control the world, they value profits and their own, uh, their own bottom line over that of lives. And we've seen millions of people across the world die in all these wars and all these coups just so the world's markets, resources, land and labor could be available to multinational corporations for them to exploit and uh, for... Uh, at the expense of the populations of all these countries. So, you know, basically, I'm not going to really talk much about my time in the military. It's, uh, but uh, I didn't really get that light bulb moment when I was in. You know, I kind of just joined, you know, for the same reason why uh, a lot of other people joined. Uh, people have various different reasons. One reason is because of, you know, economic opportunities. I mean, instead of going to debt for college, a lot of people are like, hey, you know, let me join the military, let me get my free college. Uh, you know, other people join because, you know, they see it as a way out. Uh, maybe uh, a lot of people are in a bad place in life and they see it as a way out. Um, so there are various different reasons why people join. And, you know, this and coming back to us being quashed by this economic system, it's it's this uh, it's this, um, you know, urgency of, uh, you know, people struggling financially, which leads some people to join the military. And, you know, they want us to live paycheck to paycheck because then, you know, how are you going to, how are they going to, how are they going to convince people that they have to fight for corporations if there's a reason for them? Yeah. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because that uh, allows me to kind of uh, share my story of how, you know, I ended up uh, joining. Oh, yeah. Go um, on, Conrad. Well, you know, like I said, I come from one of the poorest black communities in the United States. And, you know, there's not a lot of uh, opportunities in that area. You know, when I made it to high school, basically I could see the recruiters like uh, targeting the young men in our school. And it, it actually got so bad that in my school, the recruiters would actually uh, take over the classes. And so the teacher would kind of be pushed out and the recruiter would be in there, you know, reading you a story and stuff like that instead of the teacher. And we would have all these uh, assemblies where the recruiters would be there, you know, giving these presentations and stuff like that. And it happened at such a, a regular pace, you know, we just grew to see them as almost like, you know, one of the guys or, you know, part of, you know, part of the uh, faculty. You know, and, and a lot of the imperialism, that the U.S. military is allowed to enact across the world is based on toxic masculinity. You know, they send they send in the military, they send in these recruiters, and they take young male masculinity and they mold it to a profitable uh, uh, fashion. So, you know, you have these young men, especially today, where, where they're having this crisis of masculinity where they don't have a purpose, you know, in today's society because, you know, that uh, provider, protector, uh, old school, archaic gender role too, you know, uh, they, they don't have a purpose today. So the U.S. military, that comes, they come into these poor communities where these disillusioned young men are kind of wandering around 
and they say, come here, you know, I've got the answers for you. I, I'll show you what a man is. This is what masculinity is right here, you know? And um, so I think for me uh, personally, um, that's what lured me to, you know, kind of join in the army because I kind of had that absence of meaning, you know, and in addition to, like I said, not having uh, economic opportunity. And it was the same thing for, you know, most of the other uh, young guys I talked to that had just, you know, joined up too. So, um, and so you go, you know, you go to basic training and they, they're chanting these slogans constantly, you know, uh, kill, kill, kill. And now I know it's bad enough in the army, but I'm sure it's probably even worse in the Marines. So they basically reshape your personality and refashion it into an engine for imperialism. And so I think, uh, you know, today uh, we urgently have to have to restructure heterosexual masculinity around something healthy. You know, if we want to counteract the, the lure of this, uh, this U.S. Army military apparatus. We have a culture of war, you know, I mean, it, it's it's like. If you're a farmer, you're probably going to like vegetables, you know, or or cows or whatever you grow. I mean, our largest export is weapons. And that's that's like that's only a part of it. I mean, we are obsessed with death. We are obsessed with war and killing and violence and it permeates all of our media. I mean, it's like the media, the, the things that the violence that is allowed on American TV that is totally commonplace that'll get you the fucking PG rating is like completely not allowed in any other country. And to speak to sexuality, it's like in France, you know, I'm sure Americans are horrified that a, a titty can appear on TV, you know? There's there's nudity on t daytime TV that children could be exposed to something that gives them life, whereas they can't show people getting disemboweled and falling on a spike or getting their head blown off. But you turn on the TV and flip through the channels, I bet one third of those channels depict incredibly graphic violence. And it's like, that's just one aspect of it, the way that media is, it, it inculcates this need for us to fight each other, to compete. I mean, really, I think that's the deepest root is competition, is competition is just naturally going to yield people to fight. To hurt each other because it's like if you have especially in a system where so many people have so little power you have no true power true power is the ability to help others true power is the ability to up, uplift and bring people up and help and heal and you know do things together to to co cooperate cooperation is true power it's the true source of all the great accomplishments of humanity and if you have no true power and no true voice uh, Marshall McLuhan said that violence is uh, is a sort a search for identity, that it 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 shows it gives people an opportunity to create an identity for themselves to feel powerful even if it's only for ten seconds and then they put the gun in their own mouth. You know, you touched on the rapes in Japan. That also demonstrates you know sort of this toxic masculinity that's underlying this uh, this military culture. You know, and, and of course, a lot of that, you know, the sexual misconduct and stuff in the military was uh, suppressed. You know, the women who would come forward reporting rapes and stuff like that would be shamed and silenced. And, you know, a lot of times they would get uh, discharged pretty quick and in some cases end up dead, as you saw with a young woman at Fort Hood. I think uh, and when you really look at what is American masculinity. What is the, the norm in terms of the norms in terms of American masculinity? What's considered healthy masculinity in America? And when you really think about what it's become, you look at it and it's really Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the embodiment of American masculinity. Take what you want, fuck pretty women, acquire objects, talk over people, you know, just, just assert yourself at all costs. Hey guys, so yeah, I just wanted to go back a step or two, um, I guess not too far back because you're still talking about toxic masculinity. Uh, and as the rest of my uh, 
my group knows here, I like to, to go down the rabbit hole to the root of things. And so to point out toxic masculinity, particularly in America, is to, of course, link it to things like colonialism and imperialism, which are rooted in religion, particularly Christianity, in which the gender paradigm is the most relevant, as well as the concept of conquer and indoctrinate in the name of their savior. I just want to pre be transparent. I'm coming into this conversation as a student by choice because I don't feel like I have a comp comprehensive enough knowledge to speak with authority on matters like the industrial war complex. I, of course, have my, for lack of a better term, passionate, uh, fired up opinions about it. Um, but to <laughs> zone in on the most recent affairs, uh, yeah, that's put it lightly, isn't it, Marlo? To zone in on the most recent affairs between Israel and Palestine, um, I mean, I have a pseudo knowledge of the the history the keystones in in the in the timeline of that that bloody uh battle that's ensued it seems for a hundred years uh probably longer and and i just wonder is is it really just of biblical origins are we really still fighting a bloody battle today based on what um someone's uh entity said uh you know like hey this land's yours you can kill whoever you want for it or is it more political uh is it really just all propaganda you know there's the 1929 massacre of of Jews by Arabs. There's a 1967 six day war. There was a 1970 something election that probably exasperated the West Bank uh, occupants via labor settlements. And here we are in 2021 watching children and women and families and men uh, just be bombed to obliteration because somebody wants to live on their land. Can somebody wrap my head around that for me? And being the two of you are veterans and have had firsthand experience with the difference between what really goes on and the propaganda that were said. What are what is your take on that? And I'm asking both Prentice and Joseph. Well, if you listen to what Joe Biden said, he said that uh, Israel was created. Their purpose is to protect U.S. interests in the region. Before that, actually, they were created to protect British interests in the region. So uh, America is really just kind of carrying on that tradition of supporting Israel to create and facilitate this standardization of market capitalism across the world. Because, uh, it's, it's, you know, Israel and Israel's culture is more conducive to capitalism than the Palestinian culture, you see. Uh, Israeli culture is more uh, westernized. Palestinian culture is more collective. And you can't have collectivism. You see what I'm saying? Collectivism is the enemy, is the, the mortal enemy of capitalism. Capitalism is hyper-individualism. Capitalism is competition. Capitalism is profits over people. They use the justification that, you know, uh, Israel was sold that land by some Palestinian landlords. That gives them primacy in terms of the claims in that region, yada, yada. So basically this idea that somebody can basically buy the land up, you know, from under your feet uh, and just draw squares and, on, and planet Earth and say, oh, this is my land now. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a sick, sick idea and ideology and, and outlook on life that's, that's perpetuated by U.S. dollars. I just want to say, how sick does uh, does does a race, does a sector, does a does a nation have to be to support that kind of carnage, like the seven hundred thirty-five million dollar arms deal? Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know where that went. I seen it, I got sick, and I swiped. Um, I didn't even want to know anymore. Like. What are we doing to ourselves? Why is this kind of thing allowed to go on? Why, why is our nation the richest na nation on earth, so to speak, but built on, you know, built off the blood uh, that's been shed by by all the other nations that, that that we've sold arms to to destroy each other with? Now that's completely terribly worded, and I'll probably go back and dub that, cut that editor. But uh, basically, Amanda, I you got to stop dubbing things. Nation on earth, so to speak. <laughs> you got to let it fly. I know. I know. I know, I know, I know. You're dropping bombs but, uh, here. You're I think, doubting uh, yourself. Only, I, but I don't want to drop bombs. I don't want anybody to drop bombs. I want the bombs to stop. Truth bombs. We got to stop the bombs, people. And love. Stop blowing people <laughs> up. Blow, blow up I, the group chat, not the for other real. country that has the resources you want. Exactly. The authority that is placed on people is so arbitrary. You know, authoritative sources can print straight up lies. So it's like, I feel like all of us should 
speak up. We all should say we shouldn't feel like I don't I'm not qualified to talk about the issues in Palestine. I don't I you know, a few minutes of research will show you it's pretty fucking simple. There's an enormous power asymmetry and one one civilization, one state has nuclear weapons and you know, the state of the art missile defense system and they're dropping tear gas with drones and the other the other group of people is has is having their land stolen from them, and they're throwing rocks, and they have you know these ro- their rockets don't even hit ninety percent of the time. It's like there is no contest here. It's so it's it's not as it's simultaneously way 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 complicated, but not as complicated as we as they want you to think it is. They want you to think that only they can understand it when they don't fucking understand it. Like the the Joe Biden quote you're talking about, Prentice. I, I remembered it. It was utterly disgusting. It's it's Biden from the old days with his cue ball head, you know. And uh, he's he's saying before the uh, hair piece. There's no apology to be made. Yeah, he's saying no, Israel is the, the best, is the best three billion dollar investment we've made. ever made. He says like word for word. He says if Israel not didn't exist, Israel, we would States have to America invent would have Israel. To invent an Israel to protect her interest. And see, the the thing is, a lot of our other political leaders have quotes like that. You see, but uh, the media won't report on it, so they have to be resurrected. Like that uh, Joe Biden quote was resurrected. They will, they have let it slip that Israel was created, or their purpose is to protect U.S. interests in the region, financial interests. Uh, and you know, Joe Biden, he has a lot of quotes like that where he'll spill the beans and stuff like that. And once again, the media is not reporting on them. And since you know he's been in office since like what 1973 or something like that. Um, you know, a lot, of these, a lot of these quotes are like buried. You know, he's uh, he's almost as pathological as Trump is. He's just, uh, you know, he's just better in front of the camera. Um, and that's really the only difference. And I think the exchange that you and Marlo just had so clear and presently exemplifies how our quote unquote global defense is no more than a resource acquisition campaign as I've used that term over and over. And so, so much of our funding goes into industrial war complex, not so they can uh, necessarily uh, defend our country, so to speak, but just so they have that much more power to continue their conquest to to conquer and and, and acquire the infinite acquisition machine uh, global and now we're going into space now we get to see what what happens up in the stars how that will unfold i really i really hope that it goes something more like star trek than uh than star wars <laughs> Dear listener, Google rods of God to uh, have your day ruined. Um, so, Joey, I have a perfect, simple question for you. I was trying to, I, I was too big. I got lost in the sauce. What does the phrase war is a racket mean? A real husky war, like any other act of the devil, recognizes nothing, man or investment. And the only way for neutrals, nations or individuals to have peace and safety is to get out of the road way out and stay out glad you asked that well it was uh it was after i got out of the military where i kind of had this light bulb uh moment and that led me on a journey of all sorts and uh so wars a racket was actually written by smedley butler who was a former marine general he was one of the i think one of only two marines to win two medal of honor awards and you know the odd part is in uh marine corps recruit training or boot camp uh, you know, like like what Prentice was saying, you scream a lot of things in boot camp. That was one of the things we screamed. They're like two Marines, two medals, and we screamed Smedley Butler, you know. So we were drilled. Uh, so that's one of the things we were just drilled in our head. We're, we're always screaming Smedley Butler, Smedley Butler, Smedley Butler. You know, even like the base in Okinawa is named after Smedley Butler. And then I get out of the military, like about like a couple years after, and I find out that Smedley Butler – actually was arguably one of the biggest anti-war activists of all time. And this was, of course, after he retired. Uh, and he wrote the book, War is a Racket. War is a Racket was, it was probably said by people before him, but the term became very popularized with him. And the book is a very short book. It's like some, it's a book you could read in literally an hour. And basically in the book, he outlines uh, whom, why, well, like why are war, wars fought, who makes money off the wars and who makes money off wars? Well, it's not just weapon contractors. Obviously, you know, you have your Lockheed and uh, your Boeing and your Raytheon, you know, all these companies that sell arms 
And in many cases, they sell arms to both sides in a conflict uh, to further hedge their bets. Um, not only do these uh, arm manufacturers uh, make money off the war, but all the other industries that go into war. I mean, when you have troops in war, you have to sell them clothes. You have to sell them, uh, you know, Kevlar helmets and all this equipment, food. Of course, you need steel. You need oil to fuel the war machine. So you have all of these secondary industries that that uh, that make money off of war, too. And in this book, War is a Racket, he literally listed all the money that all these industries made in World War I. So you have weapon industry, oil, copper, uh, aluminum. You have uh, cl even clothing companies, food, et cetera, e even companies that make boots. They made a lot of money, too. So he, he labeled uh, all of these companies and, like, basically who makes money off of war, why are these wars fought, and how to end the racket. And, you know, and that was one of the things that really got me. That was one of the things that really led me on a journey. It was that, and that's the motivation. That was uh, where I got the name of my account from, War is a Racket. It was from that book by Smedley Butler, who were told in boot camp, oh, this guy's one of the greatest Marines of all time. He won two Medal of Honor Award winner. But they don't realize that he wrote the book War is a Racket. He's like, he, he, he's one of the people that laid out the blueprint for exposing these wars in the first place. And, um, and, after reading that book, it led me on a journey of all sorts. It led me to do even more research on, you know, finding out, uh, you know, why many of these wars are fought. You know, I think one of the wars uh, that really kind of led me on a further journey was, you know, you have wars in Syria and Iraq and throughout the region. That kind of got me because, you know, I, I, I was always kind of politically inclined, especially for wars, but I didn't realize the real reason these wars were fought. Like, I was always on the impression, yeah, you know, intervening in these countries is stupid because it's making these places worse off. But I didn't realize that this is all to sustain a global racket. And, you know, because there's a lot of money to be made in war. I mean, think about it. If there is no war, how are these companies going to make money? I mean... I, th I think I think the topic of war has to be approached through this way. So instead of thinking that, oh, uh, these people that wage wars and all these politicians that start wars, they're just doing it because they're stupid or, you know, that's one thing we hear. We're like, oh, Bush started the Iraq war because he was a dummy. No, he knew exactly what he was doing. And the war benefited a whole bunch of corporations that benefited weapon countries, uh, companies, especially, you know, you have uh, former Vice President Dick Cheney, who made a bunch of money from, I think it was Raytheon, I believe. Uh, you got a nice payout from them for getting them good business, uh, which the Iraq war brought. And then, you know, of course, all the oil companies that uh, penetrated Iraq's markets during that time. So, you know, instead of approaching war from, oh, uh, the people that people do these wars because they're just stupid and they're dumb and they don't think things through. No, the politicians and everyone and the politicians who start these wars and lead us through these wars and uh, these uh, CEOs and whatnot, they know exactly what they're doing. It's, it's making yep. a lot of money and it's fueling your business. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, why are you so angry? You know, why are you so angry? You know, well, I'll tell you why, why uh, war veterans are angry. When you find out that, you know, they built Saddam Hussein up to be this boogeyman, you know, that uh, we had to basically bomb this country into the Stone Age to defeat but at the same time they actually funded Saddam Hussein back when he was part of the the bad party um when they were supporting the bad party against um what they saw as communists in Iraq and so they funded uh Saddam Hussein into existence they gave him nuclear weapons they gave him weapons actual testimonies from the victims of Saddam Hussein, they said, uh, you know, he was such a monster that, uh, you know, he, he actually would get off on torturing people. So this was back when he was young. And uh, they actually preferred being tortured on days when Saddam Hussein was off. So this was a, they knew this guy was sick back then. But they didn't have a problem with shaking hands with him and kissing his ass uh, back when they were supposedly fighting the communists. And it's the, you know, it's the same thing with Osama bin Laden. You know, they supported Osama bin Laden <laughs> with uh, weapons and, you know, stuff like that. And he, he was a CIA asset back when he was supposedly fighting the Soviets. You know, the, once again, the big bad communists. So they, they built Saddam Hussein and Osama, Osama bin Laden 
uh, into these big, big bad boogeymen. But, you know, they weren't telling the world that they were supporting them and had a big part to play in who they ended up becoming. So that's why war veterans are angry. <laughs> that's why a lot of war veterans are angry. If I die in the combat zone, box me up and step me home. And also when you realize that, you know, they, they had some veterans actually guarding the opium fields in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, Geraldo Rivera, there's a, a famous clip of Geraldo Rivera reporting on Fox News, and he's uh, interviewing the troops. And uh, he's like, what are you doing? He's like, we're, we're guarding the poppy fields. Before the United States invaded Afghanistan, poppy opium production was almost uh, non-existent. It was almost eradicated. After the, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, poppy and opium production shot through the roof. It's just a mystery, though. You know. They hate our freedoms. It's the same. I, I mean, it's essentially the same class of people making money. I mean, the opioid crisis has killed more people than the war in Vietnam and Afghanistan together. So it's like, again, like, you know, these the casualties of this system are enormous and innumerable and unknown. You know, it's like like you said earlier, the uh, the, the majority, the privatization of war, Joey, that the that the companies like Blackwater are doing a lot of the fighting now. It's like the the emissions tallying of the United States Army is already the largest in the world, but it's like you know they're not tallying all the all these private companies. You know, Biden says he's going to take troops Afghan X number of troops out of Afghanistan, but you know, uh, does that include the the private contractors? Hell no. So I, I kind of want to shift gears here though. Um, Joey, we were talking on the phone about about this uh, earlier. We were, you were talking about the dollar hegemony. I kind of want to get more into the the actual structure of the ways that the dollar is inextricably linked with this all these conflicts. That it's it to keep to keep people hooked on the dollar. And I encourage you all to go shopping more. First, we sh we have to look at to start out this conversation. Let's look at how the United States was able to rise to be. Uh, the global superpower that they become during the Cold War and today. And I think we could trace this to the end of the 19th century. First, you had the, uh, uh, the Spanish-American War, where, uh, you know, that's, that's where uh, U.S. adventurism, I guess you could say, that's when the uh, U.S. started its adventurism around the world, you know, with Cuba and the Philippines and Guam and all these other colonies that they, uh, that they uh, acquired or they, they seized. And uh, then you have World War I, where... That was uh, basically from World War I, the United States was, uh, their industries were in demand from uh, European countries who needed arms and who needed, uh, and uh, basically uh, because of the arms and commodities provided to the European uh, powers during World War I, that gained the United States a greater foothold in the European market and continent. And this foothold really took a big way after World War II when it wasn't just a greater foothold in the European continent, but across the world as well, because there were a lot of different processes happening following World War II, which really brings us to how the dollar hegemony came about. And so what happened during World War II? Well, a lot of the European countries were, among other things, uh, European countries were destroyed, its industries were decimated. And uh, basically the United States received a productive growth spurt during the war, because while the European countries, its industries and its productive capacity was decimated, uh, the United States was just largely untouched from the war because it wasn't happening on their soil. And so it's, um, so uh, the, year, the, the, the depleted European markets provided an outlet for the surplus capital and, and productive goods to be exported to these European markets. So that's how really uh, American finance capital really uh, came about uh, into, these, uh, into the European markets. And while this was happening, obviously the European powers were decimated and they lost a lot of money and they needed to rebuild their own economies. So this was how the United States really moved into uh, the former colonies of these European powers, especially in Africa, because you know Africa is very uh, high in uh, very high in raw materials and natural resources, and these were the type of raw materials that uh, that that Europe uh, needed to extract to rebuild its industries. And so, uh, and basically, because the European economies were very weakened from the war, as you know, the United States exported its capital and goods to these depleted markets, also. 
uh, this provided an opportunity for U.S. to export its finance capital into Africa as well. And because a lot of these, a lot of these uh, colonies, uh, the European countries were losing hold of their economies just because of the war, uh, this is how the United States really moved into the continent. And, you know, and they basically took over where the British Empire left off. A lot of British bases across the world were handed over to U.S. forces. Uh, basically, U.S. dollars surpassed the British pound. And, uh, you know, and, you know, in one book I read, it's called uh, Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism by Kwame Nuk- I, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, but Kwame Nkrumah. He was basically the president of Ghana, who was uh, later uh, overthrown and, uh, uh, in a CIA coup, and I believe he was assassinated as well. Um, he wrote, a, he, in this book, he just basically explored uh, the different aspects of neocolonialism. And in the book, he says how the U.S. basically took over uh, global hegemony after the war, basically some of the things I just mentioned. Um, but uh, also, one, one thing that he mentioned in the book is that the United States was actually one of the biggest proponents of these colonies becoming independent. And it wasn't because the United States uh, genuinely cared for the independence of uh, the, the, the populations of Africa, but because uh, this further, see, this, what this further did was uh, a weekend, the already weak European holds in the colonies, and basically these uh, countries, you know, as uh, Nukramra says, that the essence of neocolonialism is granting uh, granting uh, countries the uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the illusion of sovereignty, but in reality, their uh, economic their economies and therefore their political systems are directed from the outside. So a lot of these links that were established during uh, during colonialization. Uh, as uh, Lenin put in imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism really remained, and the United States really took over a lot of this uh, these undertakings in a big way in Africa. And you know, while all this was happening, while the U.S. Uh, e- exported its surplus capital and production to not only Europe but also uh, its finance capital penetrated the markets of Africa, the United States set up a global system to maintain its hegemony. That's where you have the IMF and the World Bank. And uh, that's, this is how the U- U.S. Navy uh, decided to guard all the world's shipping lanes. That would give them bases across the world. And it's through these institutions and then uh, un- and, and, uh, through the Navy. And also, uh, the, the second thing that is how the United States is able to maintain their hegemony today is by the U.S. dollar being the reserve currency of the planet. And so basically, 80, more than 80 percent of global assets are in U.S. dollars. Pretty much every transaction in the world, either directly or indirectly, involves a dollar in some way. And so the United States is able to use this, uh, this dollar hegemony to quash countries into submission. That's what sanctions are about. I mean, basically, when you place sanctions and embargoes on countries, you prevent them from, you, you could basically shut down their interaction with the rest of the global economy. Since everything's in dollars, you basically have the, they have the power to do that. So, you know, a lot of these countries that refuse to submit to the global system dominated by uh, Western capitalists, um, they're basically sanctioned, like in Cuba, like in the DPRK, um, like we see in Iran and uh, other countries that refuse to submit to the United States. And, and it's, it's through the U.S. dollar that um, the United States is able to exercise this hegemony and basically shut countries out of the global economy. And, you know, and, let, and we, we could get to the Iraq example for a, se- a second. Um, you know, after the war, uh, this was not, not really like after the war, but this was during the 70s. But the, the tracings for this uh, really started after the war were uh, how the United how the dollar became the global reserve cur- currency is through something called the petrodollar. And so basically, the United States made a deal with the OPEC countries, especially Saudi Arabia, that, okay, you have to accept, uh, you could only sell oil for dollars. So you could only accept U.S. dollars for your oil. And in exchange for that, we will place military bases on your country. So we will basically, uh, we will basically protect your monarchies from the people revolting against you, which is what we do in Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Bahrain. We basically, our military is basically there to protect these monarchies against the people that want to revolt against them. And in exchange, these uh, oil rich countries have to accept dollars for oil. So that's basically how one of the main ways and how the dollar became the global reserve currency is through the petrodollar. And some and many of these wars are because countries uh, refuse to, you know, among other things, obviously, countries when they nationalize the resources and their markets, and it's just like we discussed earlier, when they decide to 
utilize their economic resources for their own development rather than the profits of multinational corporations. There are cases like in Iraq where Saddam Hussein uh, refused, uh, started to accept euros for oil. And that's one of the main things that prompted the invasion of Iraq. So, you know, I know I'm going on a bit of a rambling rant here, but you know. Joey, that's the point. That's why I brought you onto this show, man. That's what, that's what I wanted. That's what I knew was I was going to get when I, I, I slid into your DMs on Instagram. I knew that rant was, was coming because I needed it and I needed to share it. And that was the most amazing unfolding of that timeline I've ever heard be condensed and explained in such an absorbable manner. Like, wow. So thank you for taking the time to do that. The part yeah. that I really want to, I want to grasp onto there is, is, uh, the big dirty C word communism. <laughs> so bring, bring it, bringing kind of, kind of recycling. I got a couple of points. I want to kind of try to coalesce here. We're going back to World War II. That you, what the way that U.S. fought World War II was through industry, through production, and you know that that they didn't, they weren't so much fighting the war, and there's so much to talk about economic warfare. I mean, the the, the whole the whole Pearl Harbor incident of like, oh, they sucker punched us. The way that the media spun that, the way that the political cartoons and the narrative and then TV and everybody said that this is why we have to get involved in the war. And Smedley Butler was against World War II. He said, don't, we cannot go to World War II. This is going to be unimaginably horrible. We can't go to this war. It's 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 a racket. It's a you know. And so we waged economic warfare on Japan. And you know that doesn't sound so bad in in the history books. In the uh, you know the the books that they teach us in schools, it sounds like um, yeah we just lightly starve them, we just lightly put our boot on their neck and kept their children from eating, and they sucker punched us out of nowhere, and we had to bomb them, and then we had to nuke them, and it's just it's it's an utter absurdity to think that this was a justified thing when we were attacking them the whole time. Not this was this was not unprovoked, but so America uh, used World War II. To expand itself, Hashtag Gaza. to expand itself yeah. massively, to ramp up production to an enormous degree. And what they functionally did, the thing that, quote, made America great was collectivizing the means of production. They seized the means of production for one common end, and that's the war economy. And it's an it's just mind cracking to think about that. I I actually had the, the great pleasure of seeing Marianne Williamson speak many times. I worked on her campaign briefly and did some video for her. And she said one of the most brilliant sentences that I've, that I've heard anybody say about climate change. And she just it's just so perfect because it's so tailored to the American consciousness that we need a World War II level mass mobilization. And that's a way of saying we need to seize the means of production and gear them toward fighting climate change, toward uh, transforming our economy. Because Amer America pre-World War II, America post-World War II, completely different. You have a country that's a big country with a lot of resources and a lot of muscle, but, but they're not nobody on the world stage. They're not a major player. By the end of World War II, they are calling the shots. I mean, you've got Truman's nerdy little ass bossing the meeting around with Stalin and Churchill because he knows he's carrying the cards. And it's because they have this war machine. They have built this incredibly powerful machine that they, they seized all the factories. They took a factory that was making lipstick tubes and they made it into a factory that made bullets. Everything became about the war machine. And at this time, uh, marketing and advertising as industries, this was the last paper I did in, in, in college before I dropped out. It was like intro to intro to history class. And they're like, oh, we'll give you a fun one. World War II, 10 pages, right? We know you got into this because you know you, you got suckered by the World War II propaganda of that the, Uni the United States did this un unquestionably good moral just thing by going and saving the day in World War II, which is I always just kind of felt was bullshit or just didn't compel me. So that essay kind of broke me. I was like, World War II, 10 pages. How do I, I got to understand this thing. And what really cracked it for me was finding uh, political cartoons by Dr. Seuss, where he drew Japanese people as insects and basically was like, okay, we need to destroy them. And all these ads for war bonds. And then, you know, I found war is a racket and that blew it open for me. But the, the marketing and advertising connection is amazing because that was a dying industry before World War II. And we needed people to buy, 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 buy these war bonds to, to feed the war machine, to get all these donations, you know, to get any money that, that would have gone toward, you know, a candy bar for little Johnny is going to go to feed the war machine. It's going to go to put bullets in humans. So marketing and advertising was transformed to the point where we needed people fueling these factories that are pumping out a battleship a week that are that are pumping out all this incredible productive output and then by the time the war, the war ended it wasn't like okay we're going to scale back production it was like oh hell no we're not going to scale back production we are going to re continue to ramp it up oh go ahead go ahead so real, real quick real, real real let me just loop it here that marketing and advertising uh 
kept going to pump people up to unnaturally produce on the scale that they could continue, you know, that, that battleship a week scale of just like people buying fucking M&Ms and lipstick tubes. The factories went back to producing whatever bullshit they were before, a non-essential goods. And then after the war, it was like, no, no, we're going to keep producing like this. So go, go ahead, Prentice. Well, I wanted to add to that, uh, add something to that quote you said, where they said uh, uh, we needed a World War II um, type of war. Um, mass mobilization. Even, mass mobilization, yeah. Even prior to that, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, he said uh, he should welcome almost any war because he thought basically the, the young men in the country needed a war to masculine, uh, masculinize, basically. He thought uh, the men in the country were getting soft. And, of course, this was uh, right before, um, you know, they pushed us into the Spanish-American War. So this is, uh, <laughs> you know, once again, there's that tie-in, you know, toxic masculinity. Well, there's, there's, a, there's an essential point there that we have a crisis of purpose, and that's what you said, you know, was your motivation, was uh, you had no meaning in your life. And it's like, we need, you know, this, this notion, we need a war, you know, people are too soft and weak, we need a war, we need to toughen these boys up. It's like, well, no, we need a reason to live. And we have this perfect reason to live that the war, the real threat that's facing all of us is the collapse of our ecology. It's the systemic consequence of this monetary system that has destroyed ecology around the world that will kill all of us, that will, the cost, the casualties of climate collapse are so much greater even than new, than new than a nuclear bomb dropping. So we have this opportunity to if we can see, take this energy, this all this this drive and gusto that goes into keeping people pumped up for the war machine and put that into collectivizing our society to give everyone a purpose to fight this fight, you know, to make these sacrifices, to grow these victory gardens, to do what we did in World War II. For people fighting on a domestic front, they made all these sacrifices. And it's like, oh, I'm not going to stop eating or eating less meat for climate change. I'm not going to stop driving my diesel truck. But it's like if, if they were doing it for a war, they would be like, hell yeah, I'll stop doing this. I will do all these things. Well, so we need to recon reconfigure our priorities toward collectivizing. So I kind of want to use the last uh, time that we have here to talk about where do we go from here? You know, what is the system that we could build? This word that keeps coming up, collectivism, what does that mean to all of us and how can we build that together? I'm having such a good time. <laughs> Going back to, to talk about the hegemony of the American dollar and also tying into what Marlo was saying about how America, for lack of a better term, um, corporatizes everything around the world. Um, so a little bit of homework for the listeners. If you will just Google uh, the beloved artist Banksy's piece titled Napalm Girl. Uh, if that doesn't speak to you and sum it all up, then you still have a lot of work to do. But I, I just want to encourage everyone to, to give that a look and see what you draw from it because it really sums everything up that everyone's been saying here today in a simple black and white contrast image. But, but go on. Let's talk about why we're here, uh, what our plan is, and where we're headed. No, I mean, it's a great conversation. You guys bring up some really good points, too, especially with, um, you know, just how just how deep the profit system runs internationally and, and with the war being a racket, essentially, to spread capitalism over overseas and to all these countries who literally were probably doing just fine without us and probably would have been fine, would continue to do fine without capitalism with a lot of their collective systems. And, you know, it, it's a multi it's a multi headed beast, I guess you could say, because not only do you have, you know, us spreading inequality and capitalism and these things that are, you know, maybe they might be helping a, a good number of people, but they're also harming a lot of people at the same time. And not only that, they're harming the, our planet and, and you know, ex exasperating climate change and, and essentially going the direction that we've been going just at a greater speed and a greater pace. And essentially, when, when, do, we, when do we, you know, say enough is enough? When do we stop that? When do we say, put an end to this war machine that is going, you know, beyond any anything that really it's it's telling us on the surface and i think a lot of us kind of know that too you know we know, we know that there's underlying profit motives behind a lot of these wars behind a lot of these occupations you know behind the military bases that are in a lot of these countries um i mean what, what is it going to take it, it, do you think it's the 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 united states public or or, or world public that are just going to have to come come together and put their foot down one day or is there some is there some way that we can kind of dismantle this piece by piece you know i mean what, what are the next steps i mean essentially 
essentially we want to take this, you know, to obviously a moneyless society, resource-based economy sort of thing that we've been talking about and whatnot. Um, but I mean, what what do you guys being, you know, it, kind of in you, you've been up close and personal with this monster of the war machine before. Uh, what do you think it's going to take in order for us to really kind of curtail what it's done and, and start heading in the you know, direction of a more egalitarian society that actually, you know, uh, kind of co- can collectively take care of people and, and, you know, give humanity what it really deserves? What, what is it going to take? Well, I think it's going to take the development of absolute cynicism when it comes to faith in the U.S. Uh, federal political system. You know, because as long as people sit around and think, oh, you know, we're just one one vote away from fixing everything, you know, they're not going to even accept the idea that we can create alternative communities and stuff like that. You know, um, and that's one of the reasons why I have no mercy when it comes to uh, dismantling a Joe Biden or Donald Trump or whoever it is uh, that's up there lying to the public. You know, whichever snake and stick in a suit they want to put up there, and that's a really good point too. I was I was reading an article. Sorry to sorry to interrupt you right off the bat. There, I was reading an article by Caitlin Johnstone, but she talks about um, something called the House Overton favorite. window, right? The incredible shrinking Katie. Overton window, and. Um, and uh, I mean, I forget exactly a lot of the quotes in the article, but essentially it's like, why do why are these things even an option? Why are they on the table? You know, why are we talking about destroying other countries and, you know, exploiting resources and people and things like that when we should talk about we should be talking about just stopping doing that altogether and using those same resources to help people? You know, that 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 conversation isn't even on the table. It's like I think I think what you're well, talking they, about they, is they kind have of this to attitude that, that they have this attitude that we need to use war to stop war. You know, we need good money to stop bad money. We know we need, you know, good X to stop bad X. (laughs) It's just so wrong. It's just just, there's no systemic insight. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for me, it's just frustrating to see so many, you know, uh, well-meaning socialists and, you know, leftists, you know, still putting so much of their resources and faith and trust in these politicians when, those resources and emotional energy could be better served in creating our own communities or at least, you know, freeing people to the point where they can, you know, branch off and start forming alternative communities. You know, you came to the right podcast for that. We have the power to do that with the internet. You know, we don't have to uh, be face to face with somebody to help, um, you know, start creating those conditions, you know. Um, And I I think we underestimate our power, our collective power. Um, And instead we place it in a a Joe Biden or a Donald Trump. Or even somebody like Bernie Sanders or AOC, you know. They're not, they can't dismantle the war machine. It's bigger than they are. Thanks to the narrative of toxic, of toxic individualism, we I don't think that most of us are even aware of our power collectively. Like obviously that's 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 the cornerstone of uh, resistance and rebellion is to be able to enact our powers um, as one big united group moving forward together against the establishment. And so it's not always I think that we don't believe in ourselves; it's that we don't know we have something to believe in. Right, and a lot of us just can't agree. That's the. I mean, in, in the U.S., it's. I mean, we had what seventy million people vote for Trump. Still, I mean, that kind of worries me on on to a, to a little degree that we still have that many people. Well, you know, I think that, we, that may, we may have just had some, we may have just delusion. had seventy million people that voted against Biden. You know, and we had seventy million people who voted uh, against Trump. You know, we didn't. How many people actually were like, "Yes, I'm all about this." I'm yeah, stoked on I don't this. know. <laughs> It, it, it kind of worries me in a sense, you know, that we're still that I think, you know, um, that we still have that many people out there that simply did that one way or the other. You know, I, I'm not really sure what other what other way to say that. <laughs> I have a question for you, Joe. Oh, go ahead, Prentice. But I mean, just think about if just a fraction of like you mentioned, Bernie Sanders, the, a fraction of the people who donated to Bernie Sanders campaign, if just a fraction of those people donated a dollar to debt relief for other socialists or, or uh, medical expenses for other socialists and stuff like that. You know, I mean, we, they could literally change the country 
and they don't understand that they can do that, you know? Um, so I, I think that's what it's going to take. And that starting, you know, things like that, just getting them sort of activities in motion can help us sort of transition towards freeing people so that they can uh, form alternative communities and stuff like that. I think he's on the right track there too. And I think a lot of it is just going to be, you know, getting people to agree on one subject, like you're saying, forming alternative community. I think that's, I think that's what a lot of people simply want is they want an alternative. You know, they want some sort of, you know, escape from the system to where they feel, you know, they can take part in something that actually cares about them that, um, you know, that they can participate in and really grow and will actually have their back, you know, when, if, and when it comes down to it. And, and I mean, those are the types of systems and structures that we're looking to create eventually. And I think a lot of people are kind of in the same boat. They just don't know exactly where to start, uh, you know, what to do, who to work with, you know, where to go. Cause these are immense, huge projects. And not only that, we're doing something that hasn't really been done before on a, on a large scale. You know, I mean, sure. There's, you know, intentional communities and, and, you know, whatever you want to call it, hippie communities here and there that kind of, Form, but never has anything really been done like this and succeeded on at least a large scale. Definitely not in the United States. Maybe here and there in other countries. I know, like uh, revolutionary Spain. I think you know, kind of came pretty far with these sorts of ideas before they were eventually shut down. Um, you know, but but in reality, this is a concept that's kind of foreign to a lot of people. And, and like we were, uh, you know, talking about in previous episodes, this is going to take a whole lot of people with the same sort of vision, with the same sort of who are willing to communicate. You know, a uh, uh, in a sense, a, a, their perspective, you know, having the same perspective and the same goal uh, to kind of create these sorts of sustainable community structures and systems and coming together and realizing, you know, I know we have some differences, but we see enough things together, you know, that we can definitely head in the same direction and, you know, kind of just figure things out along the way to a degree, um, you know, while having some uh, kind of a general plan and goal to, to get there. Well, you, you know, so. um, we have so many like pages on, you know, Facebook, um, different social media platforms like that, where they have, you know, they already have 30,000 followers. You got 30,000 followers. You have all of them just donate, just chip in a dollar. You know, everybody's, you know, most of the people on that page may be broke individual. But if you say, hey, everybody chip in a dollar and we're going to contribute to this cause this week, then next week is going to be a different cause. That's that's thirty thousand dollars, you know. Um, and you add that up for a, a week. I mean, that is revolutionary. That's the point I wanted to make, and I've been writing this movie or working on this movie for the last three years, and it's about crashing the U.S. dollar. That it's a speculative tool, and just like we're seeing with AMC and and uh, GameStop and all of these shorts and things like that, which is crazy because that's exactly what I was writing about three fucking years ago, and we kind of shot our shot. But the dollar is a speculative thing; it doesn't exist really. It's not based on anything. I mean, the closest thing we have is the petrodollar. That's based on. Uh, someone told me this years ago that the reason the U.S. dollar is so strong is because the U.S. military is the most likely to be the last man standing. So it's this totally disgusting. Euroboros of of this snake eating its own tail that the dollar fuels the war machine and the war machine fuels the dollar and I, I have this question you know who is the last boss is it the military or is it the financial institution but I think if we crash the dollar if we take the dollar out the war machine goes away and we don't have to fight that because this is this is kind of the last thing I want to put to you two soldiers you two intellectual warriors that we cannot fight this war machine. I don't think we can physically, not through, not with weapons. They have weapons we can't, we, we don't even know about yet. I mean, we don't, they don't really fight wars by just shooting guns at people anymore, aiming, you know, it's not like the, the skill of their soldiers. It's, it's the, it's industrial. It's an industrialized technological war machine. They have robot assassins, you know, they don't, they're not, it's not, fighting the U.S. Army is, would be, an incredibly alienating, weird, technological science fiction conflict. You know, you it wouldn't just be our people against their people, and the people with the with the will will win. We want it more, and we're morally right and just. It's I don't think it's possible to to win at at the war game against that. But but it's like I've always said this: if you have the the people power to topple a state, you know, even hypothetically, whatever, you know, you have the power to do it without firing a shot. And I think. 
collectivizing is the way that if more of us come together and seize our power, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Joey, I want to ask you, what is your perspective on the prospects of a militant struggle? Or what is the alternative? How do we fight? How do we fight fighting? Yeah, well, there's many things we could do as far as moving forward. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of contradictions inherent in society and throughout the world. So we have to, so, you know, of course, we could focus on a lot of these, but I think the primary contradiction that's really holding much of the world back from its own uh, liberation, especially when you consider Africa, Asia, the Middle East, uh, Latin America, uh, the number one contradiction is U.S. imperialism and uh, the U.S. as being the global hegemon. So, um, and when you consider that uh, U.S. imperialism, all the wars, the CIA coups, the sanctions that prevent populations from even importing food and medicine, uh, you know, all these things, the sanctions, the wars, the coups result in the deaths of tens of millions. So I think us, like, especially as, uh, as Americans, especially in the belly of the beast, um, we should all be able to, especially us on the left, instead of just fighting with each other, you know, you see a lot of left infighting around all this, like, uh, secondary, these, a lot of these things that we leftists fight over, a lot of tedious things, like, oh, whether this country should be so is considered socialist or not. Instead of just, like, uh, having all these arguments, let's just agree that the number one enemy is U.S. imperialism, the number one enemy is our own government, and we should put all of our energy into opposing U.S. imperialism first and foremost is because when U.S. imperialism crashes, that will lead to the liberation of a lot of these countries around the world. And, and then when you think about what happens when – so when you think about what happens when all these countries uh, in the global south, when, uh, when the boot of U.S. imperialism comes off of them, and they pursue their own courses of economic development, what happens to the, the capitalists and the multi national corporations that uh, control the global economy, well, they lose their they lose their reliable sources of profit extraction, where they could get these cheap raw materials and keep these uh, global South countries in subservient trade relationships and keeping their economies dependent on uh, the imperial core, on the beast. And so when these countries break away from capitalism, um, a lot of these uh, multinational corporations and capitalists, they're going to have to uh, figure out new ways to uh, keep up their profits. So they're going to, so what they're going to have to do is because they can't rely on a global South anymore. Once the global South is uh, liberated from the yoke of global capitalism and imperialism, what they'll have to do is to uh, take a more inward approach and drive up exploitation within their own countries. And once these corporations drive up exploitation even more in the United States, because they can't do it in the global South anymore, this will provoke a more of a militant uh, kind of a, uh, I guess say a, a more militant type of character because there's going to be because from that you're going to see emergence of a lot more contradictions within U.S. society, and you know that will create a more uh, uh, militant like uh, uh, I guess aesthetic or character of uh, of leftists and revolutionaries in the United States, and I think this will have the option. This will uh, lead to increasing consciousness even more in the United States. So basically, uh, my point is we could do a few things. One, support revolutionary movements and liberation movements in the global South, support people who are fighting against U.S. imperialism, support them no matter how. It doesn't matter if you disagree with them on this issue or this issue. If they're opposing U.S. imperialism and they're opposing hegemony, they're seeking to bring their countries out of the uh, out of this um, out of this system that keeps them subservient to the United States and the Western countries, support them. And at the same time, while you support them, uh, build up your own power structures within your communities here. Do mutual aid. Help out. Feed the homeless. Uh, you know, help out your friends. Help out your neighbors. You know, if they need, uh, if they're, if they're, um, they they have high uh, doctor bills or high whatever, or they they want to go to college. You know, you find ways to help each other out and have a. You know, get get more, get closer with your community. Do all these things. Build power structures. Educate your community. Edu agitate the masses. You know, you can educate through social media. This is the age of social media. Educate there. Have book reading clubs. Do mutual aid, or you know, do what the Black Panthers did. But in the Black Panthers, they would do mutual aid. They would have breakfast programs. They would uh, they would uh, uh, they would feed their community. At the same time, they would combine that with education to further. Uh, radicalize and educate the masses increase people's own consciousness. So basically my point is uh, build your own power structure, educate your communities about U.S. imperialism and about all these other things that are just at the, the root of this uh, very uh, exploitative system. And while you do that, support liberation movements in the global south. So when these global south countries break away 
from uh, from uh, uh, global capitalism and the, and the Western imperialist order, then you'll be ready when this more uh, when this when this increased exploitation inevitably comes back here to, within your own countries and you see more of a fascistic approach from your own governments as a result. Then you'll be ready because hey, you built up your power structures. The 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 the, the masses are agitated. They're they're conscious. So you know because you did all that while you're uh, while all this overseas was happening. Now you're ready when the inevitable comes back home. Yeah, you mentioned uh, mutual aid, man. And I think, uh, me personally, I think if we can perfect a uh, mutual aid approach, uh, we can present to the world, you know, this, uh, this is what leftism, this is what communism, this is what anarchism offers as an alternative to capitalism. And I think a, a little quick point there that, you know, when talking about a resource-based economy or talking about communism, talking about anarchism, all of these all of these isms, all of these things are ultimately kind of getting in the way. And that's the source of a lot of these discursions, of the, a lot of this conflict and this fighting is that people identify with, oh, I'm a communist or I'm this. It's like, no, you're a human being engaged in a global struggle. You are trying to build a better world. You are trying to build the best possible world. And I think that, you know, it, really the end goal of communism, the end goal of, of uh, anarchism, the end, uh, an, an RBE, a resource-based economy, these are all words. These are all words and lenses and modalities of discussing the, the, the world beyond this current addiction, this addiction to war and bloodshed and competition. Sorry. Yeah, let's put, let's, put all, let's put all that aside and let's concentrate on one issue at a time. You know, in turn, in a, in a mutual aid approach. You know, let's let's pool our resources, let's pool our uh, brain power, and you know, develop a way to provide um, disadvantaged people with free internet. You know, um, let's let's uh, create a, a network to where we can free people from student debt. You know, where we can uh, alleviate medical debt. You know, uh, so that nobody has to go bankrupt just because they need a life-saving procedure. You know, one issue at a time, and if, if we can approach and tackle that one issue at a time in a mutual aid sense, we can show the world, this is the alternative right here. You know, there's not just one way to live your life. You know what I'm saying? And I think that would provide people with hope and that would breathe life into alternative communities so that we can use that as a bridge and a launch pad into more complex um, community activities, community building activities to where we can eventually fund our own housing to alleviate this housing crisis that we have right now. I think we have the, the numbers, we have, the, we have people with the charisma to do that. We have the end. people have uh, the yearning for that those type of communities right now. For every person that the United States has, imperial complex has killed, for every casualty, you know, for every child that's been blown up in a bomb, you know, everyone around them will, will for the rest of their life hate this entity, and will know that is not the way. That is not who we are. That is not what we want to be. And I think it's, it's interesting thinking about the military as a weird form of, of uh, collectivism. You know, everybody's needs are met. Everybody gets fed. Everybody gets taken care of. You know, uh, I had a, an old Kentucky hillbilly friend say that the Marine Corps for him was like, he was like, well, that's communism. You know, that's what it is. Everybody takes care of each other. Everybody, you know, you see everybody in your group as you, you know, and and that's really what we need. We need to meet each other's needs. We need to come together and say, so long as you contribute to this cause, you're, you will have what you need. You'll get an education. You'll get health care. The cause just happens to be blowing people up to make people rich. Change the cause and, and end this crisis of meaning. <laughs> you know, like I said, we got these pages, you know, popular pages on social media with 20, 30,000 followers, man. You know, there's no reason why all of these communities, online communities, should, should be separate and not doing activities to where they're fundraising for activities that can free people, that can, you know, help and demonstrate positive collectivism to the world, you know, because right now, sadly, 
capitalism and conservatism, they're filling that void. You know, it's disgusting to say, but, you know, the mega churches and stuff like that are filling that void. The military, like you said, is filling that void, you know, but I think, I think we have the opportunity to provide an alternative. Yeah, and, and to address what you're the point you're making too is is it's interesting what you say. It's I mean, you would think that a lot of people that are of the same mind like that that are on these, you know, groups and pages and whatnot, when you have twenty, thirty, forty thousand uh, you know, people who have subscribed to a page or liked a page or something like that. It's really interesting because when you start asking for donations a lot of the time, then it's crickets. You know, it's kind of like why there's almost a there's almost a dichotomy there, too, because people want to see this stuff happen a lot of the time. But either they can't or they won't. They can't afford, you know, to help it or or there. I, I think a lot of the time people aren't seeing enough of a direct uh you know, a direct improvement in their lives, you know, initially, you know, if you could if you could give somebody an incentive and something, uh, you know, to invest in something like that, that would directly improve their lives that they could see, you know, a benefit from, you know, uh, much more immediately than say, hey, you know, when we get to a million bucks or whatever, we're going to build a community or something like that. Or, I mean, even smaller amounts, I think it's, you know, it's it's unrealistic for a lot of the people. They can't connect the dots uh, that many down the line to see. Okay, if I give this person a dollar, or five dollars, or ten dollars, and then thirty thousand other people do the same thing, then we'll eventually have this nice community and everything going. One of the main reasons why I kind of turned towards cooperatives and people actually building businesses uh, that essentially can eventually combine and help people get the necessities that they need for free. You know, if, if you're working for a company, right, and you say you just have a job with this company doing, who knows what it is, marketing, or it's a, uh, you know, an agriculture service or something like that. But all of a sudden, this company can give you free housing and free water and free clothing and, you know, maybe free internet and free food and give you a paycheck on top of it. And, you know, and all of a sudden you have the opportunity to live in a community environment with like other people who are working for the same company and like more of a work, live, play environment. I think people will kind of jump on things like that more to kind of initially be immersed in it, you know, and take and take part helping build something like that, too. So those are those are the kind of structures that we're kind of really trying to experiment more with. And I think that people will have more of a direct incentive, uh, you know, to jump in and contribute, uh, you know, their time and labor and maybe even money, too, if they have it, you know, uh, if they if they know it's boots on the ground, that they're physically doing something that we're actually starting to build these communities, even if it isn't perfect from the start, we're we're getting something together, you know, I and that's that's kind of where the, where this whole thing is headed eventually we're not there yet but those are the uh, you know ideas and the things we have you know and, and the works for the long I think run. a big part of that is is bringing together uh, you know we all met on the internet. I mean, it's 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 amazing. And for for every, I had this conversation the other day with a friend. Was like the internet. It's it used to be a cool place where you can meet like minded people, but it's not like that anymore. And I was like, motherfucker, I met you on the internet. Like I was the same person I was talking to. You know, <laughs> we all met on the internet through this technology <laughs> that is fundamentally compromised, and it does keep people discursive. Yeah, but it's like. It, it can be a, a, a one of the most powerful forces for good there is. And I think a big step for me is was just, you know, reaching out to Joey, you know, reaching out to Prentice. I mean, Prentice and I are in a group chat right now on Instagram called Comrades, and it it's full of other people with accounts. And, you know, so-and-so might have a 1,000 followers, so-and-so might have 2,000, so-and-so might have 30,000, whatever. But it's like if we bring to get, come together and are actually working to create communities, you know, not just here's my page, like and share, but, like, start a fucking group chat, you know, and re reach out to other meme accounts. Yeah, the book reading idea is a great idea too. Um, I even think we could we could fund like documentary viewings and expand, kind of expand from that too. Um, because I, I think the interest for that is is there as well in terms of community activities. I would really like for this moneyless society community to grow and grow and grow, and you know, and and to have streaming services, to have documentaries that are going, to have people always talking to each other, to have people always working on these things. You know, it's like this is kind of the I think maybe the tip of the iceberg at this moment right now, like talking about it in this public way, in this piece of content that we can 
mass produce essentially and then send out there so people can engage in this discourse and 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 see us doing it see us in a room well we're not in a room we're all in zoom in different states but you know we're doing it we're doing this and i i think i'm incredibly optimistic i i mean i, I feel like i say that every episode i love this i love the a social ecology of bringing people together i mean we've been talking for an hour and 40 minutes and this has been one of the best conversations i've ever had and with two people that i've talked to on the phone once you know, Matt Matt texted me before the show, like, who are we meeting with today? Who are we talking to? And it's like, this has been this has been smashing. And I think we can do this, all of us, every, anybody, you know, don't just be silent. Don't just lurk, you know, reach out and try to make connections with people through social media. We have to go further. It isn't just a, a structural, systemic, change the system, change the world thing. It's like, we do need to get more involved. And I think part of that is realizing that we do have a voice. We can, you know, even if we don't have a a degree, or even if we haven't read the, uh, I, I, I was picturing y'all earlier telling your stories. I was picturing you like on the stacks of all these books, you know, like these, and then you're like doing, you're like doing dips on them, like reading, a, reading a book at the same time, you know, we, we can always, we can all become that. We can all get that strong, but it's like, you can speak up about Palestine, even if you're not a fucking expert on it. I'm the product of the group brain. And that's that's what I gained from uh, the book readings and stuff like that. Because when you're doing those activities and you're reading those books together, the other person is picking up on things that you missed. And they're filling in the blanks uh, for you in terms of awareness. And you're feeding off of each other and your intelligence grows exponentially as a result of that. And, you know, it's an, it's an incredible experience, you know, but once again, that's the difference between toxic individualism and positive collectivism, you know, and then the differences are stark. So just, I just want to add that to what you were saying there. Just to kind of bring things around here, because I think we are running out of time. I mean, really, we're the opposite of a military, you know, the opposite of the military, the anti-military is it's collective, you know, and that's what makes the military successful. You know, any military unit, you don't have, I, I mean, maybe there are there are units like this where there's one person who goes out there and fights the war alone. Fuck that. No, it's not. It's it's groups of groups. It's communes of communes. It's, you know, it's squads of units of, of you know, it, it's it's collectivism. And that's anybody who wants to argue that collectivism doesn't work. It's like, um, look at the military. Pretty fucking successful. You know, pretty powerful money-making venture. Pretty, pretty powerful operation. You know, everybody's needs are met. It's like, you don't, it's not like, a, you know, oh, you have to kill three people and then you get to eat. It's like, there's no weird incentive there. It's like, there's a bottom line that's met and incredible things are done. I mean, in, in this horrible logic of seeing the, the wonders of what we have done with our technology, what the United States war machine has created, it is a staggering, productive success story in the most macabre and gruesome way. This is what we can do. When we collectivize for evil, what's interesting? What what's interesting too is the the United States military. Military, the one main major difference that would say the United States military isn't socialist is that the service members don't actually own the military, right? They're just paid by the government, right? Imagine, imagine the incentive. I mean, if it wasn't the military, you know, for blowing people up, but ima imagine how much more incentive people could be, uh, you know, people could derive from that if they actually owned a part of the entity as well. In my opinion, that's even, even better than what the military has right now, as far as the collectivism goes, but it goes to show you how well it works in a sense too, just when you meet people's needs, you know, when you have people's needs met with food, water, shelter, especially the camaraderie and everything everything that you experience in the military. Imagine if you could put that on steroids by doing something positive with it and then giving people ownership interest in addition to it. It's like people say it wouldn't work. Are you kidding me? Like, look at how well it works with that already. You know, imagine if we could twist that and make it positive. You know, that's that's kind of something that I've, I've thought about in the past, you know. But Squads just of people going there. in and dismantling the concrete and planting thousands of millions of seeds, you know. Pl platoons right. of, of elite hunger uh, eradicators Caters, going going around this world feeding people you know giving them medicine healing them i mean if if we look at this the militarism as a model for how the world could be run in a collectivist way it's like we find what people are good at we let them do it we put them together with other people who are good at doing it who complement their skill set we train them we teach them how to do what they're trying to do and send them all over the world and make things happen make terrible things happen that could be wonderful things I think that's 
uh, an amazing way of thinking about it. You know, I, I've never really considered that before, but that's what we could do. It's a beautiful structure that the, the organizational structure is all there, but it's just this bullshit hierarchy. And Smedley Butler talked about that, about the, you know, the, the generals, he's just saying like, you know, the, every squad member or every, every rank just responds to the rank above them. You know, they don't really have the, the big picture and they are the ones that are calling the shots and creating things when it's like, we should all be creating our own destiny, creating our own world, building the world that we all participate in, that we all live in because we're, at this point, you know, us not forming a collective movement to change the world is going to put the bullet in the head of every child that's, you know, yet to be born. Profoundly and tragically true. And I just want to point out, obviously, but, and again, I tend to be Captain Obvious, but for the, the sector of the audience that, that are new and still wrapping their head around all these concepts and these terms, uh, trying to latch on to something that each of you have expounded on, uh, what uh, keeps ringing in my head is the term paradigm shift. I think we can all agree that that is the next step. Uh, as Matt was asking recently, what is the next step? Where are we at? How do we get there? It, none of this will be realized without the paradigm shift. And myself personally um, have never been so excited to see how people are reacting to the establishment. Uh, perhaps I'm being naive, I think just optimistic, but to be positive for a moment, we really do still have uh, a significant amount of momentum from the pandemic to work off of. Uh, and, and comrades like you, Joseph and Prentice, uh, give life to, to my efforts, like breathe life into my efforts every day and my news feed and uh and i've been blessed recently to move into a community where uh, i have tangible support like not to say that social media doesn't offer tangible support but like in-person tangible support as well so yeah it's that paradigm paradigm shift that we have to continue trying to catalyze in order to make these these transitions forward obviously uh and how do we do that is the question well we, we keep coming together like we are here we keep putting ourselves out there like each of us are doing now and we just make it so clear and present it's unavoidable that there are others out there who are there to support you if you decide you want to answer that uh, thing that's tugging at your intuition, that voice in the back of your head that's saying something isn't right. This this is wrong. Something doesn't make sense. These people, I feel I resonate with what they're saying, but it's not what I've been told to do and what to believe and yada, yada, yada. So, so yeah, we just got to keep coming together and do this alternate media thing for sure. I, I kind of want to bring us around full circle here because we're coming up on time. I, I, I'd like to give it to, I'd like to pass the rock to, uh, to Joey to uh, give us some closing statements if you can. Um, cause you're so articulate and you have so much to say <laughs> It's such a way of saying it. You say it with this glee, but when we were first, uh, started talking, you told me that, uh, what you're doing now, you know, you started out, you, you joined the, the military and, and now you're a nutritionist. You're all about health and cultivating health. And I think that's really what we all need to shift for metaphorically in a broad sense. We need to, we need to broadly shift from taking life en masse in a mass produced systematized way to creating it systematically. So Joey, um, wh whatever you have to say that it, it, as a message for listeners, um, just, I just, I just give that to you. One thing I could say to listeners, there's a lot of things I could say, but one thing I will say to listeners, especially listeners living in the United States is that, you know, your own government and your own uh, capitalist class, that's your number one enemy. And, you know, despite uh, all the other contradictions uh, within society, you have to realize that it is your own government who has, you know, along with, uh, among other things, destroyed the entire planet. And especially when we look at the latter half of the 20th century. And, uh, you know, it is your government uh, that, and your, your own capitalist class that is, and uh, in, in the West as a whole, that's really uh, preventing, uh, the liberation of all these other countries across across the world and not only is this occurring at the expense of the lives of millions but at the expense of the environment and of the climate and as climate change gets even worse uh, uh, these things will come to a, a head and things will not get better and if we don't uh, really uh, come about in a big way to first oppose uh, our own war machine and uh, u.s imperialism but also to develop our own uh, kind of power structures within our own communities. You know, you know, get friendlier with your communities. Uh, meet people online. Uh, you know, do these book reading clubs. Do mutual aid. Uh, uh, do what you can to build solidarity 
uh, not only uh, within the country, but uh, across the world and, you know, provide material support to people fighting uh, U.S. imperialism. And no level of support is too small or too immaterial. If you think it may not be enough, it is enough. There's, there's no sort of support that's too small. So whatever you could do, whether it be donations or educating people or even posting, nothing is too small for solidarity. And I think showing the solidarity, not only for uh, communities across the planet fighting against U.S. imperialism and fighting for their own liberation, but communities uh, in the country fighting for uh, justice and liberation, I think uh, solidarity is very important. Solidarity is borderless and uh, solidarity and knowing who the enemies are and fighting against them is the way we move forward in this society. I recite the English translations of these lyrics sung by the great Argentinian protest singer Mercedes Sosa, who sang out against the oppression of her people by the imperial powers of the United States and its dog, the military. All I ask of God is that no injustice be meaningless to me that they not slap my other cheek after a claw has scratched away my fortune. All I ask of God is that war not be meaningless to me. It is a huge monster and it tramples hard upon all the poor innocents of the people. All I ask of God is that deception not be meaningless to me. If a traitor is able to get one over on the many, that those many not readily forget it. All I ask of God is that the future not be meaningless to me. Lost is one who must leave in order to find a new home. All I ask of God is that war not be meaningless to me. It is a huge monster and it tramples hard upon all the poor innocents of the people. On behalf of the Moneyless Society team, thank you very much for making time and space for us on your journey through this world. Alternate media isn't a profitable venture, which is why listeners like you are crucial to getting the word out. Major networks don't support true dialogue, only biased narratives. So, whether it's a like, a follow, a sub, or a share, it all helps to fight the algorithms that work day and night to suppress the truth. If we want to make it out of this mess alive, we've got to be as dedicated to supporting change as the machine is dedicated to keeping everything the same. Meanwhile, the world's on fire, which makes it painfully clear that we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there when it comes to our plans to offer more than a podcast. Things like demonstrable communities and regenerative infrastructure. To feed it, visit us on Patreon who, by the way, had been suppressing our visibility due to not being profitable enough for their platform. How capitalist of them. So if any of you out there have had trouble finding us on Patreon, that's why. But you can find us at www.patreon.com forward slash Moneyless Society and every week with a new episode on all the major streaming platforms as well as YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. There are solutions to all of today's systemic issues and you are the answer to the biggest one. In solidarity, be well.